You're listening to a CNA podcast. Innovation is all around us. Sometimes changes in new technology can feel kind of breathless, sometimes like science fiction. And when it comes to energy, things are happening fast. Today, we go on a discovery to find some of the most interesting and potentially impactful clean energy tech. Hi, and welcome to Climate Conversations. I'm Jack Board. Hello, Leading Tan. I hope you're good. I am. Thank you. You're a sci-fi nerd, right? And somehow you always seem reluctant to embrace the, <laughs> the brave new world of new technology. So explain yourself. Okay, yeah, I I am a bit of a sci-fi nerd, but I lean more to the science part of that than the tech part of that, especially mm, um, when it comes okay. to the science uh, behind our own destruction. You, on the other hand, wow, Jack, wow. are the eternal optimist with your AI and high-tech solutions, no? No, I'm no eternal optimist, but I just think it's, how could you separate the science from the tech? The tech is coming from from science. Well, These things tech, are, tech isn't really know, nice to link too. together. I struggle with tech. I feel like you want to watch the, the robots take over on your screen, but then when it's happening in real life, you, you get worried. Yeah. Something like okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so we thought about this topic uh, because it is International Day of Clean Energy coming up this weekend on January 26. I know we have a lot of these days, but this one was a, a declaration from the UN General Assembly to raise awareness and encourage action for a transition to clean energy. So I think we can kind of lean into that a little bit and do the same. So that brings me to today's quiz. Mm -hmm. Li Ling, how good is your knowledge about the clean energy rollout? Oh, it is so good. So good. Okay. <laughs> you should be able to nail this one then. I want you to please, for me, rank the clean technology by how much of it is installed around the world. Simple, right? Four options. Wind, hydro, solar, and bioenergy. Okay. Okay. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Okay, we'll see. You're confident. Answers will be at the end of the pod. And now for our main story this week. Clean energy innovation. It has lots of dimensions. At its core, helping mitigate climate change is what this technology is for. It also has social and economic factors and benefits, powering up communities in cheaper or more efficient ways, reducing air pollution. Now, the rollout of clean tech has been rapid. I'm sure you are aware of that. Renewable energy additions grew 17% in 2024 alone. And so it will continue. Global renewable capacity is expected to grow by 2.7 times by 2030. So how's that happening? Let's go through a few interesting technologies each, chat about how they could impact us and our world. Li Ling, you're up first and you've got... Kind of a controversial choice. First kind up, of, I think. depending who you are. Tell me about it. Mm, so I'm going to yeah. start. Maybe not controversial, but mm, not doing iffy. that well. Kind of iffy. Mm, iffy. Yeah. iffy. So I'm going to talk about green hydrogen. Theoretically, this could be the long term answer to our clean energy needs. It's been talked about a lot. And the concept is simple enough, right? Hydrogen is the H2 in H2O. So it's a matter of splitting water molecules into its hydrogen and oxygen parts. Mm, okay. Are we having a science class here? <laughs> That's right. And it, it's something that many of us who paid attention to in, in science class would know. But to make not hydrogen me, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. But to make hydrogen green. I'll school you now on this. Please. This splitting process of extracting the parts out of H2O must be powered by renewable energy sources like wind or solar. And that's what makes hydrogen green. The problem is that this takes up a lot of energy, a lot more energy than conventional fuels would. And it makes green hydrogen very expensive to produce. That is a huge obstacle and has been a huge obstacle in bringing green hydrogen to market. Also, hydrogen itself is very volatile and flammable, so it's difficult to store and also dif difficult to transport. So mass production has always been difficult to achieve. But still, several countries, including Singapore, China, and even your Australia, 
are heavily investing in this space, we can expect some progress over the next few years. One other exciting development too is that researchers have managed to produce green hydrogen from seawater. So that's exciting because seawater mm. is everywhere and it's a very available resource. But it just seems like hydrogen is not taken off, perhaps like we, we thought it might. Japan, for example, invested a lot in trying to create hydrogen cells for consumer vehicles, for example, that hasn't really worked. I myself invested in some <laughs> ETFs, just a minor investment in ETFs, tracking hydrogen technology companies. Let me tell you, Leeling, that has been a lot of lost money. That's oh, not going well so hear. far. That's why you have to keep your day job, right? <laughs> yeah. And then I think blue hydrogen is the other element, which is proving popular in the United States right now. Of course, blue hydrogen doesn't have to use renewable energy to to produce. So mm -hmm. a lot of the big gas and fossil fuel companies are pretty keen on on using some of their infrastructure to produce hydrogen. So, so mm. wait, what is the difference between green hydrogen and blue hydrogen, Jack? Well, blue hydrogen is just hydrogen fuel produced from fossil gas. They would use carbon capture and storage instead of using renewable energy to produce it. So it's framed as a type of fuel that is reducing environmental impacts, but critics say that it's not really a proper climate solution because it does allow for the continued use of fossil fuels. Right. And grey hydrogen is basically produced from fossil fuels without capturing greenhouse gases. So green, blue and grey hydrogen. What about you, Jack? What clean energy advancement or innovation has put the spring in your step? So to speak. For me, it's batteries. And what's piqued my interest is solid state batteries. So mm. basically, instead of a liquid inside the battery acting as the electrolyte, this new technology uses, you guessed it, a solid. So <laughs> no. they can be made from all sorts of like various materials, right? Like ceramic, different kinds of plastic polymers or a composition of materials. But why, how, what difference does it make between liquid and solid? So there are a few different reasons. One is safety. These types of batteries are less likely to catch on fire or leak. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have seen issues with electric vehicles catching on fire, for example. Oh, yeah. And that's used as a big argument against them by people who are anti-EV. And more importantly, solid state batteries, if developed, could last longer and could also hold more energy. And then the materials used could also be more sustainable. So that could impact the carbon footprint of a battery. And then, of course, batteries with much longer life cycles and efficiencies could help reduce the amount of core minerals that we're actually pulling out of the ground. And then the waste as well at the other end of their life. So you're saying that a battery that could be charged, for example, 100,000 times would have mm. much more sustainability than current lithium ion technology. Yeah, makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. If you could charge a battery and it continues to work for years and years and years, mm -hmm. and you're not needing to replace that battery, mm -hmm. then of course that's going to have an impact. And this 100,000 charges figure is something that battery companies are working on. And so imagine putting these into electric vehicles, you could reduce the carbon footprints of those EVs by up to 39%, which is mm. a figure based on a UK study. So I guess it also then makes sense that it's automakers who are pretty keen on this tech. And so welcome to the stage, companies like Toyota, um, BYD, they're both making big strides in this space. And of course, there are all sorts of other type of batteries being developed too. It's a little bit of a battery race at the moment, I think nanobolt batteries, sodium ion batteries, and even technology that's using gold. So yeah, a lot happening, lots of potential. Thoughts on that? Nope. This is all you. No thoughts. You can okay, be the no battery thoughts. guy. All you. <laughs> okay. All right. Pretty important, I think, actually. What else have you got that you think is cool? I'm going with a new take on a long-running concept. Hydropower. Mm. So, Jack, did you know that hydropower is the largest source of renewable energy? It accounts for, I think, half of the world's uh, renewable energy currently, more than wind and solar. Mm, for now, for now it is. <laughs> the environmental impact of hydropower is a little bit dodgy for 
local communities, for river flow, for uh, flora and fauna, tends to displace people and animals. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I think there is some debate about whether we still want to be considering hydropower as a renewable source of energy. Of course it is, but is it sustainable? That's a different question. Hmm. Yeah, and with this rapid development in solar and wind, uh, hydroelectricity, hydropower is becoming less popular as well. Yeah, so- climate change impacting all of this, right? If you're just not getting the rainfall that you were before, and then your rivers are not flowing and your hydropower dams are not generating electricity. But there is one area of hydropower that could be a game changer tidal power. And Mm. this holds particular promise for coastal communities. And unlike dams that generate hydroelectricity, this type of hydropower converts energy from tides and it can be clean and reliable. There is a lot of potential, but it's still in the early development stage. There needs to be a lot more work done to see if this can become a reality. That said, I'm very excited to see how tidal power plays out. Yeah, I saw some tidal technologies being worked on when I visited the very uh, north of Scotland a few years ago, up in the Orkney Islands. It's a bit of a test bed for a lot of these new technologies. Super rough waves, strong ocean currents, high mm-hmm. winds. So for companies that want to test out if their technology works, they're heading there. And it was interesting to meet Indonesian researchers who were there doing pilot projects around tidal. Indonesia is really interested in this technology, as you can imagine. Archipelago, Mm -hmm. lots of islands that need power. If you can get tidal to work, it's basically unlimited uh, Mm -hmm. energy that you could use to, to power up communities instead of having to develop more expensive or send transmission lines into Mm -hmm. remote parts of the country. So yeah, title just not quite there yet, but no. if they can work out the the logistics of it and the technology to work, yeah, I think it has a lot of potential. Exciting. Yeah. It's one of all these emerging technologies that we're looking at as the world races to meet its net zero targets and to cut back on their emissions. What else are you looking at? Okay, something that's completely new to me. I'd never really heard of this. It's pretty sciencey, I guess, but mm. I think it's also really interesting. Metal Organic Frameworks, or MOFs. I think people are calling them MOFs. (laughs) I haven't heard anyone call them that, but I was reading Mm. about it, and they keep getting referred to as MOFs. So anyway, what I understand is that these are these super porous sponges made of metals and other organic molecules, basically these metal ions or clusters that are all attached to one another, and they end up having these huge surface areas chemical versatility, depending on what they're being developed for. And mm-hmm. they can they kind of seem like magical <laughs> sorts of things. Like they can capture, store, filter harmful substances, can purify water, remove air pollution. And I think here's where it's interesting for the clean energy space. They're being created for uses in gas storage, gas separation, heat storage, carbon capture, and as catalysts for energy production. And I think researchers have been working on this for a couple of decades. Mm -hmm. It seems like the breakthroughs are starting to arrive. And from what I read, they're saying that these MOFs have seemingly limitless possibilities. So all I'm thinking about now is like a metal sponge, like the stuff you use to clean your sinks. At a molecular level. At a molecular (laughs) level. Yeah. Okay. It's not going to be an actual big metal sponge, (laughs) I don't think. Okay, hang on. I'm going to do an image search online to see what this actually looks like. And, oh, yeah, everything is molecular. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Nothing looks like a sponge. All right. It doesn't bode well for me doing a visual piece about moths. Okay, how about one more on your favorite Mm. topic? Leilin, can Mm. you guess what it might be? Could it be artificial intelligence oh no let's stick with metal organic frameworks <laughs> okay we're going to do a little bit of ai right. before we finish now i think ai innovation in the clean energy space is pretty fascinating you name it across the sector already machine learning is being implemented into smart power grids energy demand forecasting energy trading predicting when infrastructure needs maintenance for example think things like wind turbines 
even AI-assisted EV charging. In short, a lot of efficiencies that can be found across these mm. otherwise involved or, or manual tasks. And AI is our friend. Yes, it is. We kid around a lot about how I'm no fan of AI. And to be honest, you are correct. I'm not a fan of AI. But as we've talked about, I do acknowledge its uses. And I think it does expedite a lot of the processes that we would otherwise take a really long time. So yeah, it's useful. So begrudging, <laughs> this acknowledgement. Yeah. It's here to uh, say whether I like it or not. To, so. Yeah, there just have to be <laughs> rules about how we use it, particularly mm -hmm. on the consumer uh, front. Mm -hmm. I would say like one cool and specific innovation that I recall, which was recognized in Singapore, was a smart estate solution. Azendian mm -hmm. Solutions, I think it's pronounced, received the ASEAN Energy Award back in 2023 for developing an AI-powered system to help buildings in the city operate in the most efficient and optimized way. Uh, it, it's helping like detect faults in the system, that predictive maintenance that I briefly mentioned before. So make, mm -hmm. helping buildings you know, save on energy costs. And I don't think mm -hmm. you can argue with AI helping us save money, right? No, I can't. And saving energy. Can't argue with that either. So. Technology for the win. Woohoo. Okay, now it's weather time, Lily. Tell us what we've got to look forward to. Well, I know what you can look forward to. This cold streak mm -hmm. that you are enjoying so much, yeah? It's going to last through to the middle of February. Oh, what good news. <laughs> and that's basically due to a high-pressure system from China, according to the Thai Meteorological Department. Yeah, I saw this update from the yeah from the weather buffins, buffins, mm -hmm. boffins, weather folks, <laughs> <laughs> the weather people announced. Yeah, that we're going to have this cool weather through to the middle of next month. It's so nice at the moment. Like the yeah, it's pretty this exciting. cold wind. Yep. Thank you, China, for sending us your cold wind. <laughs> yeah, here in Singapore, also we're going to get cooler temperatures, but not quite the same conditions as you're experiencing or rather enjoying there in Bangkok. We're going to get more rain as northeast monsoon conditions are expected to stay until late January, end of the month. And that's according to the Singapore weather people at the National Environment Agency. So we'll have wind and heavy thundery showers over Singapore most days, as well as around parts of the region. Also as the La Nina weather event sets in this month and stays around until April. So bring out your ponchos or raincoats or whatever it is you wear to stay dry in your part of the region. Okay, back to our quiz question. Repeating, rank the clean technology by its installed capacity around the world. Wind, hydro, solar, bioenergy. And I know you said before that hydro is the biggest producer of renewable energy. It's the biggest source of renewable mm, energy the now. The biggest source. Yeah, mm. and it, as a source, it's not expected to be surpassed until later this decade. But your question about capacity, that, that's a little trickier. Just to put it in context, in terms of the largest reliable source, it's hydropower, wind, solar, and then bioenergy. But in terms of installed capacity, because of the huge investments in solar, I'm going to go with solar. It's also the fastest growing renewable energy source. So solar and then wind. And then, you know what, I'm going to change it around. Solar, hydro, wind, bioenergy. Oh, you've so much wisdom, Lily. You've, got, you've <laughs> nailed that. Four out of four. Well done. <laughs> See, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Okay, yeah. awesome. <laughs> okay, that's it for this episode of Climate Conversations. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. And there's a good chance we'll be talking about saving big cats the next episode. Same time, mm. same place, next Thursday. I'm Lee Ling Tan. I'm Jack Board. Thanks as always to the team that put together this podcast. Saya Win, Tiffany Ung, Janani Jahari, and Chris Pina Roberts. 